Here we're gonna show that two integrals have the same value, but we're not gonna calculate their value. And we're gonna use a very nice and beautiful trick that I found on the Math Stack Exchange. So I'll post some details in the description. So the two integrals in question are the integral from 0 to 1 of 1 over the natural log squared of x. So that's like take natural log of x and square that whole thing plus 1 dx. And the other one is the integral from 1 to infinity of sine of theta minus 1 over theta d theta. So let's jump into it. So the very first thing that we're going to do, which really emphasizes this entire trick, is to translate this to something having to do with complex numbers. So I'm going to notice that this guy right here can be written as the imaginary part of i times itself. Well, that's pretty clear. So here we've got this is the imaginary part of i over the natural log squared of x plus 1 dx. So just by the definition of the imaginary part, that's pretty clear. So next what I'll do is I'll add something that is real to the numerator in order to simplify this denominator. So notice I can add something real to the numerator, and since I'm taking the imaginary part, that means I really haven't added anything to the whole thing. So what should I add to the numerator that's real? Well, I'm gonna add the natural log of x. And why should I add the natural log of x? Well, that's because this denominator factors like in terms of complex conjugates. It factors like the natural log of x plus i times the natural log of x minus i. And so this takes maybe the most heinous part of this integral, which is a squared natural log in the denominator, and turns it into a linear natural log in the denominator by canceling this guy with this guy right here. Okay, so let's see what we've got. So that's gonna give us the imaginary part. I can factor the imaginary part out of the integral. That's not too hard to see. And then I have the integral from zero to one of one over the natural log of x minus i dx, like that. Next, I wanna take the opportunity to write the integrand. That is the function that we are integrating as something that looks like the zeroth integral of a function, or maybe after you've done the integral, but before you've plugged in the endpoints. And if you look around at this for a little bit, you can notice that this guy right here looks like the following quote unquote zeroth integral. It's one over the natural log of x minus i times e to the natural log of x minus i times y, where that's our new variable. And then we're evaluating that from y approaching infinity to y equals zero. So notice approaching that at y equals zero, we get e to the zero, which is one. And then as y approaches infinity, well, it looks like there might be a problem there, but notice since we're taking the imaginary part, we'll actually get something that looks like e to the minus infinity, so that cancels out to zero, and so we end up exactly with what I have circled here. Now, I can translate this thing which I'm calling a zeroth integral to a single integral inside of our single integral, giving us a double integral by taking the partial derivative with respect to y. So let's see what we get when we do that. So we'll take the partial of this with respect to y, and that's gonna give us the imaginary part of the integral from zero to one, and then the integral from zero to infinity, where I'll switch the order of integration by putting a minus sign out front, so that's not too hard to see that that is possible. And then next I have e to the natural log of x minus i times y dy dx. Now I wanna simplify this integrand a little bit so it looks like a little bit more common of a function. And I can do that by taking this and breaking it apart into two pieces, e to the natural log of x times y, but e to the natural log of x is just x, but that's being exponentiated by y, so this gives us x to the y, like that. That's actually gonna be pretty easy to work with. And then we'll have e to the minus i y, we can't do much with that, great. 
So just to reiterate, this guy right here helped us form this one right here, which I'm underlining in purple. So now we'll do two things. We'll substitute this blue version of the function into the integral and we'll change the order of integration. So that's gonna give us minus the imaginary part, the integral from zero to infinity, the integral from zero to one of x to the y e to the minus i y dx dy. Great, so again, we change the order of integration right there. Next, we can see that e to the minus i y is a constant. So that means we can just use the power rule on this term, which is x to the y. So let's see what that gives us. This term, which is x to the y, will have the antiderivative of one over y plus one times x to the y plus one. We need to evaluate that from x equals zero to one. So it's pretty easy to see for that, we're just gonna get one over y plus one. So that's gonna take care of our innermost integral, the x integral. So that will leave us with minus the imaginary part of the integral from zero to infinity of e to the minus i y over y plus one dy, like that. Now we're like actually zooming in on the end we can take this exponential thing right here, which is a complex exponential, and use Euler's formula to rewrite it as cosine y minus i sine y. Then next, we can take this minus sign, turn it into a plus, and distribute it through here. And finally, take this imaginary part and actually take the imaginary part. So the only thing contributing to the imaginary part of this is sine y. So I'll scrub off this imaginary part and just leave us with sine y. So that allows us to write this integral as sine y over y plus one dy, and it's the integral from zero to infinity. And now, as you can see, we're pretty much home free. At this point, we can make one more very simple substitution. It's maybe the simplest step of the whole integral, and that is we'll set y equal to theta minus one, which is the same thing as saying theta is equal to y plus one. So that means this thing down here becomes theta, this y becomes theta minus one, this dy becomes d theta, and then the lower bound of integration will change to one, and the upper bound of integration will stay at infinity. And so we've closed our loop on this beautiful integral identity. And that's a good place to stop.